Hello, uh, thank you for being here. My name is Rachel Dennison, and I'm excited to tell you about my new lab at Boston University. Uh, it's an ongoing and upcoming projects that I hope will be of interest to this group. So a big question that my lab is interested in is, um, how does the brain generate visual experience? Uh, I imagine that many of you are interested in this question too. Um, the approach that we'll take in my lab to investigate this question is to integrate tools from the cognitive and computational neuroscience toolkits. We aim to connect behavior to brain activity using computational models that provide a theoretical foundation. Our behavioral techniques include psychophysics and eye tracking. We make neural measurements of the human brain using fMRI, EEG, and MEG. And we develop and test models at the cognitive and neural levels that aim to predict both behavior and neural activity. So today I'd like to highlight two research projects that are relevant to this audience and are also likely to be um, major efforts of my lab in the next few years. So the first is an adversarial collaboration uh, to test competing theories of consciousness. And the second is a research program investigating temporal attention, which I see as providing a window into understanding temporal constraints on visual processing. So first I'll tell you um, how we're planning to test competing theories of consciousness. Uh, we have applied for a grant from the Templeton World Charity Foundation for a so-called adversarial collaboration that pits two theories of consciousness against each other. If our grant is funded, um, then I will be looking for a postdoc as early as January of 2021 to work on this project. So um, even though the grant is not funded yet, I thought this would be a perfect venue to talk a little about it. Now the goal of this project is to test competing theories of consciousness. First order theories say that sensory representations generate the conscious perception of sensory stimuli. Higher order theories, on the other hand, say that some higher order re-representation or some kind of pointer to the sensory representation is required. So this higher order representation is hypothesized to be in prefrontal cortex. Um, to test these theories, to pit them against each other, we have a great team of theorists who have articulated these two theoretical views, philosophers who have been wonderful in clarifying the conceptual issues at stake, and four experimental labs who have designed and will carry out the experiments designed to test conflicting predictions of these two theories. And my lab uh, is one of the experimental labs. And specifically, the role of my lab will be to test first order theories by dissociating subjective appearance from objective performance, and then measuring visual cortical activity using fMRI to see if it still tracks subjective appearance. Um, if it does, this will support first order theories. And if it doesn't, it will seriously challenge first order theories. So that's the adversarial collaboration. I'll move on now to the second project area I want to highlight, which is about temporal attention. So temporal attention is the prioritization of specific points in time. For example, if you are returning a tennis serve, um, it's important to see the ball really well at the moment it hits your opponent's racket. So you can direct your temporal attention to that specific time point. Now the way that we study temporal attention in the lab is using a temporal pre-queuing task that we developed. Um, on each trial of this task, participants are presented with a sequence of two grading targets that appear one after the other in the same location. Uh, these gradings are tilted slightly clockwise or counterclockwise, and observers are asked to report the orientation of one of these gradings. To manipulate voluntary or goal-directed temporal attention, 
we use a pre-cue, which is a tone that directs the observer to attend to either T1, T2, or in a neutral pre-cue to attend to both T1 and T2. And then after the targets appear, there's a response cue, another tone, that instructs the observer to report the orientation of either T1 or T2. So 75% uh, of uh, trials where there's a single tone pre-cue are valid trials. That means that the observer is asked to report the same target that they were asked to attend to. 25% uh, of the trials are invalid trials. That means that we ask the participants to report uh, not the target they were asked to attend to, but the other target. And on neutral trials, observers are equally likely to be asked to report either T1 or T2. So this, um, this pre-cue uh, has an incentive. Observers have an incentive to attend to the target that's indicated by that pre-cue. So behaviorally, uh, we find that discrimination performance is best for valid trials, intermediate for neutral trials, and worst for invalid trials. So we see both benefits when the pre-cue is valid and costs when the pre-cue is invalid compared to the neutral condition when they're instructed to attend to both. And we see these benefits and costs for both targets. I'm just showing the average of the targets here. What this means is that temporal attention leads to perceptual trade-offs across time. Attending to one point in time improves perception at that time, but at the cost of impaired perception shortly before and afterwards. This is what I mean by revealing temporal constraints on visual processing. You can't sustain attention maximally across these short time intervals. So now these question is how long do these trade-offs last? Uh, in another experiment, we varied the SOA or the stimulus onset asynchrony. Uh, this is just the time interval between T1 and T2. And here I'm plotting the pre-queuing effect, which is valid minus invalid for T1 on the left and T2 on the right as a function of the SOA on the x-axis. These data show that the trade-offs peak around 250 milliseconds, but interestingly disappear at both shorter and longer SOAs. So when the targets are very close together in time, you can attend to them equally well. And when they're almost one second apart, you can also attend to them equally well. This means that whatever neural constraint is responsible for these perceptual trade-offs has a time scale on the order of a few hundred milliseconds, uh, a time scale that's very relevant for much of cognition and behavior. We've developed a normalization model of dynamic attention that predicts the time course of these trade-offs as shown in the fitted curves here. Um, this model is very general, and it makes predictions about both behavior and uh, predictions that we have yet to test about neural activity. So I'm very excited to continue to develop and test it in my lab. Um, finally, we've shown that temporal attention changes the timing of microsaccades which are tiny eye movements that we make all the time, even while fixating at a single location. Um, microsaccades are inhibited before predictable events. And we've discovered that the timing of this inhibition shifts according to which target time is most relevant for the observer's behavior. So now that I've quickly reviewed uh, several of our recent findings on temporal attention, I want to relate the temporal attention data I've just shown you to this three-pronged approach to studying visual experience. So behaviorally, we've shown that temporal attention leads to both perceptual and oculomotor trade-offs. We've also developed a normalization model of dynamic attention that predicts both behavior and neural activity. 
Now, the big question, which we are, um, uh, will be pursuing in my lab for the next few years is about the brain. What are the neural mechanisms of temporal attention? We are going to use EEG, MEG, and fMRI to answer this question. Uh, we already have some MEG data that I've collected at NYU, which we are excitedly analyzing at the moment. And I'm very excited to investigate this question because we know so much less about temporal attention than about spatial attention, and much less in general about dynamic vision than about how we see uh, static images. So I think this re research program has the potential to give us some very basic information about how we see and attend in real time. I also think this research has the potential to address a fundamental question, which is what are the neural sources of the temporal limits that we observe in behavior? This connects back to consciousness in the sense that answering this question should give us insight into the neural and computational steps that are needed to generate perceptual experience. So some take home points. Uh, first, our lab at Boston University investigates perceptual and attentional selection to understand the mechanisms that generate visual experience. We use a range of cognitive and computational neuroscience tools to connect behavior to brain activity via models. Um, this year, I have uh, two new graduate students starting in my lab, uh, which is wonderful. Um, but it means that unfortunately, I will not be able to take new PhD students next year. So um, I'm not looking for uh, to recruit in this current application cycle. Uh, however, I may be recruiting a postdoc for the adversarial collaboration to start as early as January 2021. Um, and depending on how COVID goes, I may also be recruiting a full time RA in the coming year. Um, and next year, I will likely recruit new PhD students. So um, if you're interested in uh, any of this research, uh, if you want to check out our papers, please visit my website. Um, if you're interested in any of these um, open positions that may be coming up shortly, uh, please feel free to email me and let me know that you're interested in so that, so that when they come up, uh, we can chat more. Um, also, I'll be announcing all open positions on Twitter, and I've, I've given my handle here. Um, in closing, I'd just like to say that I, uh, I think that the cognitive neuroscience of consciousness is a, is a very important and exciting research area. So I'm very happy that so many of you are interested in joining us in trying to to figure it out. Uh, thank you.